Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. And we have a well-rounded plate with plenty of topics to feast on today, including a look at a new film warning of the dire consequences humans will face in just 30 years if drastic changes aren't made to the way that we eat, the way that we consume, and the way that we live. From Endgame 2050, filmmaker Dr. Sofia Pineda Ochoa will be joining us today. Dr. Ochoa, I'm very much looking forward to speaking with you about the film. I'm very much looking forward to speaking with you in general and about the film. Thank you for okay. having me. And coming up in just a bit, a country went more than 100 days without spread of the coronavirus, but that streak has now ended. And researchers believe that outbreak could be due to food imported from another country. And to discuss that, Dr. Neil Barnard will be here. Dr. Barnard, this is a pretty interesting case. I look forward to diving into that with you, sir. You bet. And there are lessons for us, too. Indeed. So send in your questions. By the way, we will be opening up the doctor's mailbag. Tweet them to us at Chuck Carroll WLC or at PCRM using the hashtag exam room live. Or you can go ahead and drop your question for Dr. Barnard right now in the comment section. But first, let's get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Wednesday, August 12th, 2020. The coronavirus continues striking parts of the South with great force, with Florida and Georgia each reporting a record number of deaths from COVID-19 on Tuesday. It's the latest blow for the states as they remain in the midst of a surge of fatalities. Health officials in Florida reporting a 22% jump in deaths over the last week. And in Georgia, the numbers paint a far bleaker picture with a 62% surge. This as neighboring Alabama is reporting an astounding 75% increase. And looking at the larger picture, the death toll is rising in 20 states as well as Puerto Rico, while the rate of new infections, though, continues to subside. Officials, though, expect more states will be added to the list as deaths lag by two weeks or longer behind infections. More than 1,400 deaths were reported all told across the country on Tuesday, bringing the total number of COVID-19 related fatalities in the U.S. to more than 100. 64,000. In Washington, D.C. yesterday. For many of us, a glass of milk can also mean a real serious bellyache. NBA champion John Sally testifying before the USDA's advisory committee overseeing the new dietary guidelines that are due out early next year. And the six foot 11 inch vegan was saying that dairy doesn't need to be a slam dunk in the diets of black Americans. The dietary guidelines recommend three servings of dairy a day, heart disease, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and asthma take the lives of Black Americans as a disproportionate rate. Sally, who is a former teammate of Michael Jordan, is banding together with hundreds of physicians to call on the USDA to dub dairy unnecessary. And with lactose intolerance affecting at least 80% of minorities in the U.S., he wondered, Why would the U.S. government tell all Americans to drink three glasses of milk a day? It's pretty hard to stomach. And finally, viral tracers in New Zealand are investigating whether the country's first coronavirus outbreak in more than 100 days came from frozen food that had been imported. Health officials say a man who handled those packages of food is believed to have tested positive for COVID-19, prompting the city of Auckland to reinstitute strict lockdowns. It's unclear exactly what type of food the man was handling. He is one of four mem of members of his family to test positive for the virus, but officials say none of them have traveled outside of the country. I want to bring in Dr. Neil Barnard to talk about this a little bit more in depth. Dr. Barnard, this is an interesting case here. Uh, the World Health Organization says that they know of no cases where a person has become infected after handling contaminated food. Yet, doesn't the fact that they're investigating this possibility, whether he got COVID-19 after handling this food, doesn't that kind of make you think it's time to you know, rethink that statement? I have to say that's exactly what people are concerned about. Just as you said, New Zealand is really an unusual country. It's, it's, they've had more than 100 days without a single new domestic case of COVID-19. That was really remarkable, but all that came to an end. And the employee in question was linked to, a, a, there's a huge company called AmeriCold, uh, an American company that, that handles storage and logistics of frozen products. So as you can imagine, the people who make frozen food, frozen meat, uh, rely on services of this type. 
And so when uh, this case recurred and, and now New Zealand is uh, tremendously concerned about a new outbreak happening, uh, the question arose is, could, could there be uh, co uh, the coronavirus coming in on frozen meat products? Um, and let, let's just walk you through a few things. The United States is far and away the, the viral fountain of the world. So we've got far more cases here than in any other country. Brazil is a, a distant second, India's third, Russia's fourth. Um, you, if, you, if you want to look um, for China, you've got to go even below these numbers. So as of August 12th, the slaughterhouse workers who are producing the foods that are refrigerated or frozen, um, as of the 12th today, uh, we had more than 40,000 infected uh, workers testing positive for COVID-19, 189 deaths. And we've stopped counting the inspectors. And this was back in May. We knew that uh, the USDA inspectors, there were more than 200 cases, five deaths, and that's just stopped being reported. So uh, undoubtedly that number is higher. But the, the point is this, uh, if the concern is that frozen products or refrigerated products could be bringing this in, uh, you only have to look at where these products are coming from. Uh, you have workers who are shoulder to shoulder, and then the products go from the slaughterhouse to your retail store. And if the worker was sneezing, coughing, or even just sweating uh, onto products, you are concerned that when you touch them and bring them home, the virus could then be transmitted to your surfaces. Uh, now, the government will say quite correctly that this is a respiratory virus, so breathing it in is the biggest issue. But the CDC also said um, that recent studies indicate that you could probably get this virus by touching a surface or an object such as frozen meat that has the virus on it. And then you touch your mouth, you touch your nose, you touch your eyes, and you get infected. So this is why China stopped accepting foods from Tyson's plant in Springdale, Arkansas. And China also was concerned not just about the chicken from Arkansas, but salmon from Norway, pork from Germany. Uh, shrimp was uh, under uh, investigation as well. Now, the, the poultry industry has fought back. They said, no way. The virus doesn't survive in food. And if you ship it uh, abroad, it's going to be sub-zero. In, in other words, it's going to be frozen. So no problem. Well, uh, if you look into the microbiological literature, you see that, in fact, the vi viruses do seem to be detectable in meat. Now, these are noroviruses, hepatitis viruses, other kinds. These are different from coronavirus. People have not yet tested COVID-19 for its viability in meat. But they have looked, and in copper, four hours, cardboard, 24 hours, plastic, stainless steel, three days, glass, tile, Teflon, five days. That's the viability of the virus. However, meat isn't served in any of these ways. It's, it's refrigerated. And if it's refrigerated, it can last for months. If it is frozen, it lasts for years. So back to New Zealand. The person, um, the, the, the whole investigation is, is centering around imported frozen products. And yes, viability of the virus is not just possible, it's what you'd expect. So the virus is highly stable at four degrees uh, Celsius. That's refrigerated, uh, but it's sensitive to heat. You can cook it, it's gone but uh, when it's refrigerated or frozen and before it's cooked, it can spread the virus to your hands, your face, your, ki your kitchen surfaces, and that's what we're concerned about. Americans eat a million animals per hour. That's why the slaughterhouses are working so hard uh, to satisfy this carnivorous habit. And then the slaughterhouse products are also sent overseas to places like New Zealand. Uh, this is part of why uh, a couple of weeks ago, LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens said, we want to stop this. We don't want our workers going into slaughterhouses. So if that's the case, uh, and if they're calling for a meat boycott, then why would a person want to buy the products that came from those places? So there you go, back to you, Chuck. Every time I, I hear you talk about the fact that Americans eat a million animals every hour, I'm still just taken aback by it. That is such an astronomical number. And you think about how much manpower goes into producing all of that meat and the outbreaks that we've seen here in the States and now uh, perhaps even going overseas. You know, we saw that in China, as you said, and now potentially in New Zealand as well. I mean, this is a real jam that we're in right now. Yes. And it's, of course, it's not only the U.S. producing meat. There are many, many countries that, that will do so. And so in New Zealand, 
Uh, the question is, where did the meat come from? Or was it meat? Was it some other product? But you know, if you order a pair of socks on Amazon, they don't come frozen. So let's say there was a chance of contamination of anything. You order a book or whatever, but it's at room temperature. At room temperature, the virus doesn't really hang around very long. But if you wanted to get the virus to survive, what you would want to do is to freeze it. Um, and that's, that, that's why the people in New Zealand are looking, at, are looking at individuals working in those places and are particularly concerned that one of them did, in fact, test positive. Important discussion. Dr. Barnard, thank you. Stick around. We're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. So if you have a question for the good doctor, go ahead and put that in the comment section now. Or again, you can send them to us on Twitter using the hashtag exam room live. Turning the page. My next guest says humanity's last chance to act is right now. That is the crux of her new film, Endgame 2050, highlighting the damage being done to the planet by the human race. We're talking about overconsumption, mass production, mass pollution, unsustainability, and without an end to all of that, the film warns we could be on the verge of extinction. And so with that, we welcome Dr. Sophia Pineda Ochoa to the exam room live. Dr. Ochoa, thank you so very much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh this is indeed an important conversation, but the, the film is really painting kind of a, a grim outlook. How, how much trouble are we actually in right now? I mean, I would say that it's, it's enough that we need to take action like yesterday. Okay. And it's not just on one thing. It's many fronts that we are affecting. And the fact of the matter is that without planetary health, we don't have human health. And so from the soil that we are eroding to the emissions that we're putting out in the environment, the carbon emissions, to the way that we're polluting, even the environment, even with something as simple as plastic, um, the way that we're contaminating the ocean and the way that the plastic degrades and the little fibers just go into the environment. It's on so many fronts that it can be a little bit overwhelming, but I believe that we should not look away just because it's overwhelming, because our protecting the environment for ourselves and for the other species that we share the planet with depends on it. So I think we have to be honest with ourselves and with the impact that we are doing and, um, and, and, and be honest and be open about it and take action and change the things that we need to change. The The title of the film, Endgame 2050, alludes to the year 2050, as in three decades from now, 30 years. What is the significance over the next 30 years? What could happen between now and then? Right. Well, and you know, I chose that. I think that's an interesting, like, um, title for a film. Obviously, that's why I chose it, like the year 2050. And there are a lot of studies that use like projections that kind of use that landmark um, like date, like around middle of the century. And and that's why I chose it. But, but the fact of the matter is that I don't want people to think, oh, we can just be okay and keep doing everything the same until 1949, because that's not gonna work out for us. Um, but what your specific question was, what kind of things are we looking at? Well, you know, it, it's all a confluence of, of issues. Like, for example, one of the issues that's mentioned in the film is overfishing and the oceans. That's, that's a subject that I feel passionate about. And that's one of the several things because the film covers um, many different areas. Some of them related to each other and some are kind of separate from each other. But just to give you an example, with regards to overfishing, um, we are overfishing the ocean to the point that with the projections of the UNFAO and of many other fisheries, you know, the data that they're putting out, if we keep fishing the way that we've been fishing, we're projected to have pretty much close to fishless oceans by the middle of the century. Um, for example, Dalhousie University projected by 2048, which is, you know, two years before 2050. But it's probably not going to be like exactly this year is when the last fish and it may not be 100 percent completely fishless, you know. But but the fact of the matter is that, you know, we are th these species like the ones that live in the ocean, they took 
millions and millions and millions of years to evolve. And right now we're just fishing them dry. And by the middle of the century, which is just in 30 years, we're projected to kind of complete decimating it, you know? So we're waging war on the ocean. We're well, waging war on the ocean and we're kind of winning at this war of, of, of kind of decimating it, you know? And that's happening on a lot of different fronts, not just the ocean, but that's just one example. Yeah, let's let's kind of connect the dots. I think that the layperson may be watching us right now and wondering, well, the fish are in the ocean, they're underwater, I'm dry and safe here on land, so why do I care if there are fish in the sea? What would the consequence be if all of the fish were to disappear? Yeah, and you know, um, well, because that's something that has not happened, we can't know exactly what the implications would be, but, um, but the fact of the matter is that we're all interconnected, even though it's kind of hard to sometimes see that, like how can I be associated with a species, you know, that doesn't look anything like me or that I don't see really how it could benefit me. But I'm just gonna give you one example about the ocean and how it can affect us. So another uh, like little chapter in the film is something in the ocean that's acidifying. So the pH in the ocean is dropping um, because of our carbon emissions that get absorbed by the ocean that turn into carbonic acid. And so the pH is acidifying and it affects the phytoplankton in the ocean. And the reason why I'm bringing all this up is because sometimes maybe you and I can think, well, who cares about phytoplankton? Like it sounds like such an obscure thing that we couldn't care less about. Um, of course, we should care about the environment and all of that, but but let me give you an example. So phytoplankton actually produces half of the, is responsible for half of the oxygen production on the planet. So these little plants that live in the ocean, they produce as much oxygen as all of the plants on land. And so that's just one example of how interconnected we are and how we can't just say, oh, who cares about this animal, this species, let it all go extinct. Who cares? Um, because we really depend on the ecosystems that support us for our environmental services. From everything from, for example, the pollinators, which is also mentioned in the film, um, you know, they, a lot of them are at risk of extinction and a, a lot of them have gone extinct recently because we've lost a huge amount of biodiversity in the last 200 years. It's really, really, really amazing in a bad way how much biodiversity we've lost. And just as an example, you know, pollinators, we're losing insect mass at about 2.5% 2. 2 per year. You know, the insects, some people may think, well, great, no more mosquitoes, right? I can go out to the front porch and just lay down and not get bitten by mosquitoes and not have the concern about bees or something. But, you know, about 70, you know, pollinators help produce about 75% of our crop species. So unless you don't care about food or unless you don't care about having, you know, clean water, clean air to breathe, that only in that case should you not care about biodiversity. But if you do care about having food to it, which I think that, you know, we don't want to have a, a fast, right? A prolonged fast of not having any food or starvation, you know? So we, we should all really care, even if it's for selfish reasons, about preserving the environment and the other species on the planet who we share it with. Yeah, well, let, let me let me jump in here and, and ask you a question. So sure. we've talked about fish and, and now we've talked about insects, but we also heard Dr. Barnard just a little bit ago talk about how the U.S. alone eats one million animals every single you know hour. I mean, that's an extraordinary amount. What kind of damage is the rate of animal agriculture here in the U.S. and worldwide? What effect is that having on the environment? Well, it's it's um. It's on many different fronts, okay? From the manure that they produce, which, you know, the latest number that was reported was from like 20 years ago, 
and it was in the amount of like 87,000 pounds, I believe per second or something like that, that the manure then reaches our limited water supply and, and causes problems um, to the land use. In particular, the land use, it's what's mentioned in the film that, that land animals have, because right now, according to the United Nations, Animal agriculture is the number one user of land on the planet, anthropogenic land user of land on the planet. So of all the activities that we do on this planet, and we do a lot of activities, and we take up a lot of land for a lot of different things, from highways to our habitats, to our suburbs, to you know all of that. But of all of the things that we use the land for, um, animal agriculture is the number one. And Animal agriculture is, on the world stage, the number one driver of deforestation. So, and deforestation is something that's happening as we speak. According to the um, WWF, they put it in, in a graphic, um, in a visual example that sometimes I like to use. They said that we are cutting up the amount that's in a football field every less than three seconds. So they said every 27, every every minute we cut down about 27 football fields mm. of forest. So can you just imagine like in, in the minute that you've been doing this show, like there have been, you know, a lot of football fields that have been, you know, have this, this uh, you know, deforestation. Mm -hmm. And so your, your question was uh, about the land animals. So yeah, I would say Number one, the land use. Number two, waste. Number three, they're very energy intensive to produce. So they actually have a very significant water footprint. And water is a precious resource that is increasingly in short supply. Um, uh, so that's just, I would say, I mean, those are by themselves very significant and very compelling for people to consider with withholding their support for this industry and not consuming any animal foods whatsoever. There's many reasons to do that, but the environmental reason alone is very, very compelling because the impact that we're having is not compatible with something that's sustainable. And if it cannot be sustained, that means it will come to an end one way or another. But right now, what we're doing is, is we're pushing the ecosystems to the limit so that, you know, it would probably come to an end just because of so much destruction. But that's very, very undesirable. You know, why would we want to destroy this planet? It's the only one that, um, the only that we one have to live on. Absolutely. Uh, we only have uh, about one minute left. Uh, I've asked this of a number of other guests, and you are certainly qualified to answer this question as well. If everyone in the world stopped eating fish, okay, so we eliminate the overfishing process. If we stopped eating meat, we took all of the animals off of the plate, and we took dairy out of our diet as well, and everybody shifted to a plant-based diet, what would the net effect be on the health of the environment? It would be immensely positive. Um, I guess for that, I, I can tell you an example of a study that came out of Oxford uh, University with Joseph Poor. He calculated that if we collectively stop consuming, he didn't go into the ocean, but I think that's self-evident. I mean, we're overfishing it to the point, you know, that so we would just stop our assault in the ocean. But with regards to land use, they calculated that if we stop consuming animal foods, we would use 75%, sorry, I'm not center. We would use 75% less farmland. So on the biodiversity front, on our land use front, that would be extremely, extremely beneficial. So not only is it something that's better for our health, but it's, it's almost impossible for us to feed humanity like that. I mean, it is impossible. It's just not an efficient way to feed humanity. So we need to realize that and, and change now. So I'm glad that you're doing your show and that you're raising awareness in the importance of this transition because it could not be more crucial or more important for us to do this collective change, um, you know, collectively and globally yesterday, today. <laughs>
And this is such a, a great film. You have a number of uh, very familiar faces that were involved in the project, including Moby, who is a friend of the Physicians Committee. Um, so I, I highly encourage everybody to go check this out. You can watch it for free right now at endgame2050.com. Dr. Sophia Pineda Ochoa, thank you so very much for your time and congratulations on the release of the film. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Time now to open up the doctor's mailbag. And to do that, we want to welcome Dr. Neil Barnard back to the show. And if you have a question, it's not too late. Go ahead and submit that in the comment section. Now we will do our very best to get you an answer. You can also tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room live. Dr. Barnard, uh, you ready to field a couple of questions here as we wrap up the yeah, show? Absolutely. This is a, a, a very interesting question that crossed today, and I'm so glad that you're here to answer this. Um, we've talked a lot about the comorbidities associated with co uh, COVID-19, and a lot of them are attributed to obesity. But here's the specific question this viewer was wondering. They want to know, is there a difference between being obese versus being overweight as far as susceptibility to the very adverse effects of COVID-19? Is one worse than another? Uh, yes, uh, very important. Uh, in fact, let me show a little graph. Uh, can we bring up, up this graphic? When the pandemic first arose in China, individuals uh, were classified based on their body weight from underweight to normal weight to overweight and to obese. And it's true, if you were overweight, you were much more likely to have severe uh, disease. If you were obese, it was much higher than not specific numbers. 29% uh, of patients who were overweight were more likely to have, were 29% had a severe disease compared to only 19% if you're normal weight, 29% if you're overweight, 39% if you were obese. So yes, uh, it just goes along with body weight. And the way to really think of it, it's not a question of whether you are overweight, obese, or some other category. It's really just a question of the more body fat a person has, the more welcome mats that you have for the virus. Uh, adipose tissue, fat tissue makes that angiotensin converting enzyme uh, welcome mat, so to speak, where the virus enters the body. Um, and then when a person is overweight, they also often get fat accumulation in the liver, in the muscle tissue, um, in other parts of the body, and that leads to a higher risk of disease too. So, yep, uh, you wanna be normal weight, or actually in China, it really looks like the best was those people who were kind of on the lower end of normal. You don't wanna be cachectic, you don't wanna be too skinny, but, um, Right there at the lower end of, of a healthy, normal weight is probably where you want to be. Okay, let's do a let's do a double dip just because uh, just yeah. because it's Wednesday. Uh, next question. This is one we get so many about uh, vitamin D. Here's one from James on Facebook. Wants to know if you are getting your vitamin D from the sun, does wearing sunscreen interfere with that? Yes, uh, and the short answer is yes, it really does. And isn't that a bummer? Because you need. Um, sunlight on your skin to produce vitamin D. And it's the UV rays, the ultraviolet rays that do it. And so if you are wearing a sunscreen on the exposed parts, obviously that's good. That, that protects you against skin aging and more importantly against skin cancer. And that blocks the vitamin D producing effect. So if you have a little sun on your unprotected skin, maybe 20 minutes a day on your face and arms, fair enough, that's good. It's more than that, you'll definitely want to use a sunscreen. And if you are using a sunscreen all the time, then you'll need to take a vitamin D supplement to get adequate vitamin D. Uh, most doctors would say about 2,000 international units a day will do the trick. All right. If we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. We have saved it, and we will do our very best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. Dr. Barnard, I appreciate your time today, my friend. You bet, Chuck. Thank you. All right. Now, coming up on the show tomorrow, right here on the exam room live, we will be getting an update on where things stand with the dietary guidelines. You know, we just heard John Sally testifying before the USDA uh, this week. So where are we in that process? And what are the odds the milk will be flushed from the recommendations? We're going to be find out when we're joined tomorrow by dietitian Susan Levin. That is right back here on Facebook and on YouTube at noon Eastern. And let's end finally with another question today. And that question is, what is preventing you from taking control of your health? I mean, really seizing control of it. If you would like some help taking your health to the next level, I highly encourage you to schedule an appointment with Susan or any one of our doctors or dietitians over at the Barnard Medical Center. And what's different about them? 
It's the fact that they specialize in preventative medicine. They know that fighting disease can start with the food that is on your plate. And they can work with you to make sure that you are being prescribed the healthiest diet of all. So right now, telemedicine appointments are available in the following states. Read them off. Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Florida, Georgia, and right here in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. Go ahead and make your appointment today if you live in any of those locations by visiting barnardmedical.org or by picking up the phone and calling 202-527-7500. And for today... That's going to do it. My thanks again to Dr. Sophia Pineda Ochoa for joining us and to the crew that makes the plant-based magic happen, including our producer, Laura Anderson. For Dr. Neil Barnard and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And until tomorrow, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.